Well, good morning. Today we're continuing our series, Be You, sort of. I want each of you to know that God made you special. Last week we talked about that God, the God of the universe, who spoke everything into being, made you just the way that you are. We read that he formed you in the dark of the womb, knitting your innermost parts together. God knows you. He is the all-knowing God, and he knows everything about us. He knows us better than we know ourselves even. So why does God go to so much trouble to know each of us as intimately as he does? Because he loves you. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he took Adam and Eve, and he put them into this beautiful place, a garden that he called Eden. But then Adam and Eve, they sinned, and in that one moment, they drove a wedge between themselves and God. And that divide was then passed down to every subsequent human being ever since that time, so that All of us are in rebellion to God. All of us are separated from the Lord and the creator of the universe. And that uh, that separation causes in us the need for salvation. That's our topic for today, salvation. You see, you can and are fully known by God, but you cannot truly know God until you've been saved until you have received redemption through Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, that makes all of the difference in the world. Today, we will learn some important truths about Jesus and about us. Today, we will learn what it looks like to be a person who confesses Jesus Christ while at the same time still being a person who needs redemption. So let's pray. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, Blessed Son, Jesus Christ, precious Holy Spirit, guide us into your presence this morning. Draw us into the, into the truth of your word. Transform our hearts to become men and women saved by grace and mercy. Speak, O Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. Our passage today may not be the first place one would think of to go to for verses on salvation, but the truth of God's word is this, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is literally on every single page, and it all points both to our need for being saved and to Jesus who saves us. So today we come to this little passage of Jesus teaching his disciples. Our passage is part of a larger journey section of Mark's gospel. It actually begins in Mark's gospel in chapter 8, verse 27, and it goes all the way through to the end of chapter 10. But the journey itself becomes the classroom, replacing the the boat or the hillside as the place that Jesus instructed his disciples. And so when you hear this term, on the way, that, that that little phrase, on the way, becomes the literary anchor to indicate the beginning of a teaching. And in reading this journey section, one realizes by the end of it how the shadow of the cross looms over the entire journey. And you understand that Jesus leads his disciples along the way, and all of the signs along the way point to Golgotha, point to Calvary. So let's stand together as we read God's word. Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 33. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them not to to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. 
But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. You may be seated. Now, I said before that this phrase, on the way, is our indication that a teaching is coming. This is the point where Jesus wants to engage his disciples and to teach them. And so he asks them the first of two probing questions. The first is, who do people say that I am? And it's worth noting that this moment comes right in the middle of Mark's gospel. Mark's gospel is thought to be the oldest. That is the first gospel that was written, especially since it's very obvious that both Luke and Matthew used it as a source for their own. But Mark lays out the purpose for his writing in the gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 1, where he says, this is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, Mark's gospel has several unique characteristics. One of those characteristics is authority. In the very first chapter of the gospel, Jesus begins teaching the people in the synagogue, and it says the people were amazed at his teaching, saying he teaches as one with authority. And he also backs that authority up with power. You see, at the beginning of Mark's gospel, we also have a story of Jesus encountering and casting out demons. He is, as Mark stated, the Messiah, the Son of God. So he has both authority and power. So as I said, this teaching on the journey is right smack in the middle of the gospel. And the first half of the gospel of Mark concentrates and is characterized by Jesus' power and authority. But right here is a change from power to weakness, from authority to submission, from a powerful Messiah to a suffering servant. And our passage today completely showcases this change and how hard that change was to understand for his faithful disciples. So our first probing question this morning is, who do people say that I am? And the disciples say, some say that you're John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others say that you're one of the prophets. And the answers to this probing question are so revealing about what people thought, what they anticipated. No one was thinking Messiah. Even though the people had been promised a Messiah, and even though the Jewish people were all eagerly awaiting the Messiah, they couldn't think that one had actually come. No. Jesus was just another messenger sent by God like all of the other messengers before. Some say John the Baptist. Now, this teaching about in the, along the journey, it takes place after John the Baptist's death. So the people are still, you know, grieving the loss of the baptizer. Even Herod feared that Jesus might be John the Baptist resurrected. But Jesus is not John the Baptist. Even John the Baptist said this in John, in the Gospel of John chapter 3. He says, you know, John the Baptist speaking, he says, "You you yourselves know that I plainly told you I am not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his successes. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. That was John the Baptist, clearly stating that Jesus is not John the Baptist, and that John the Baptist is not the Messiah. And so others say, well, maybe he's Elijah, right? Elijah was one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, and he didn't die, right? God sent a chariot down from heaven to come and get him, sort of like a heavenly Uber, right? So, so the people thought that he was going to be able to be coming back, right? Others are not sure which prophet he was, but they were sure that he was, in fact, a prophet, a messenger sent by God. So Jesus then asks his next probing question, but who do you say that I am? You see what Jesus is doing here, right? He is probing to see if they have a different opinion from the others, right? Others say, I'm I'm simply a messenger sent by God, but you 12, you've been with me. You've seen me. You've witnessed the power of the healing miracles. You've been there when my authority over demons 
has been on display and that they have to obey my commands. You've seen me walk on water. You've seen me calm the storms. You were there when I called Lazarus out of the grave. Who do you say that I am? Peter responds without hesitation. You gotta love Peter, right? He just blurts it out. You are the Christ. The word Christ, it's an interesting word. It is a Greek alliteration of the Hebrew word Messiah. And both words have as their root verb to anoint. So the direct translation then is anointed one. And contextually, it is the anointed one of God. In the Old Testament, all of the kings were anointed with sacred oil. So to be the anointed one of God was also to refer to the regality of God, the kingliness of God, establishing Jesus as the king. And it is, in fact, this charge against Jesus that is brought at his trial, right? Before Pontius Pilate, Jesus is asked, are you the king of the Jews? Now, this idea of kingship is at the root of Peter's mistake a little bit later on in the passage. But for now, it's important that we understand that Peter gives the right answer. Because it sets up Jesus' teaching about the true nature of his coming. So Peter's confession represents a much deeper understanding of Messiah, an understanding that isn't because Peter's some super smart guy, but it's an understanding that was given to him by the Holy Spirit, that was revealed by the Holy Spirit through him. And at this point, most of the people who were looking for a Messiah expected a king, a ruler who would lead Israel out of pagan Roman domination. So now we have come to the point of both of these probing questions. So that Jesus could teach his disciples and to prepare them for what was about to come. And in verse 31, we read, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. This is the gospel, that Jesus, even though he is, as Peter just declared, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one of God, he came for a very different reason, for a very different set of expectations. Jesus did not come to fulfill the expectations of man, but to do the will of the Father, to meet the expectations of God, to become the king of a heavenly kingdom. For this, Jesus, God's one and only son was anointed, set apart, because this is how God loves us. This is how God fixes that divide that was created in the Garden of Eden and has been carried on by each and every one of us ever since. He sent his son to die for your sins and for mine. Now, Peter, Peter was naturally impetuous and passionate. And in this passage, he is convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. And then he rebukes Jesus because Jesus, because he doesn't understand the kind of Messiah that he really is. Mark Strauss, a commentator, he writes this. He says, though Peter is right that Jesus is the mighty Messiah and Son of God, he cannot fathom the suffering role of the Messiah. And yet without the suffering and death, the salvation of humankind will not be accomplished. This is Satan's goal, to thwart God's plan of salvation. So while Peter understands that Jesus is the Messiah, He could only view this this Messiah as fulfilling man's expectations, not God's. So Peter rebukes Jesus. He scolds him. In verse 32, he says, uh, so Peter rebukes Jesus, rather. He, He tries to scold him. And in verse 32, Peter says, he took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Now, can you just get your head around that for a second? Right? I mean, literally two seconds ago, Peter is saying that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one of God, the very son of God, and now he's in his face telling him, hey, I know you're the son of God and everything, but you can't say this stuff. 
What happens next is very significant. Don't overlook this next little phrase. Jesus, it says, turned around and looked at his disciples. Then he reprimanded and rebuked Peter. (laughs) He wanted to make sure that he had all of his disciples' attention. This rebuke, it was not some private thing with just he and Peter. He didn't call Peter over and say, hey, hey, bro, um, let me tell you, you need to get behind me. No, he says he looked around at the disciples, meaning that he wanted everybody to pay attention, okay? Because this rebuke was for everyone. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Literally, go away, Satan. This is the same turn of phrase that Jesus uses at the end of his temptation in the wilderness. Then he tells Peter, you are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. That's pretty, that's pretty big, right? So what does all of this mean? And how is this passage about salvation? Peter is all of us. We are all full of passion. We are also all impulsive. We say really good things and we make terrible mistakes. Peter represents a person who is both redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and a work in progress. He is saved and yet still needing redemption. He has moments of heavenly understanding and others where he's just so, so human. Does that sound familiar? Last week, we discussed that the big story coming out of the Olympics in Tokyo was the mental health of the athletes. And we talked about Simone Biles and her difficulty um, with her mental state during these games. Today, I want to close with another story of a remarkable Olympian, Sydney McLaughlin. She openly admits to having worked with a sports psychologist and a new coach to prepare for this Olympics. But Sydney went very, very much deeper than just psychology. She gave her heart to Jesus Christ. Her testimony at the games has been remarkable and refreshing. After winning gold in the 400 meter hurdles, she said to the NBC interviewer after her victory, all glory to God in heaven. The interviewer then asked her what she credits for her performance and she replied, Honestly, this season, just working with my new coach and my new support system, it's truly just faith and trusting the process. I couldn't ask for anything more, and truly, it is all a gift from God. And then in another post-race interview that night with even more media members, McLaughlin was asked if she ever felt frustrated after many times finishing behind Delilah Muhammad, who was a teammate. This happened at the 2019 World Championships. Muhammad is credited for setting the standard in women's 400 meter hurdles. This is what McLaughlin said. Delilah is a great competitor, but I think I was growing into my own person. And I think the biggest difference this year is my faith, trusting God and trusting the process and knowing that he is in control of everything. And as long as I put the hard work in, he is going to carry me through, she said. And I really cannot do anything more but to give the glory to him at this point. McLaughlin's faith in Christ is on public display on her social media pages. On Twitter, she describes herself as a child of God and and has an image with Saved by Grace as her profile picture. On Instagram, her bio simply reads, Jesus saved me. She also talked about her world world record in June, saying, I no longer run for self-recognition, but to reflect his perfect will that is already set in stone. I don't deserve anything, she says, but by the grace through faith, Jesus has given me everything. Then she says, records come and go. The glory of God is eternal. Thank you, Father. She's like 20 In November, she posted a video of her getting baptized in the ocean on a beach in Los Angeles. And it says, for 21 years, I was running away from the greatest gift I could ever receive. And by his grace, I've been saved. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. My past has been made clean because of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friends, that is what salvation looks like. 
Sydney runs to glorify God a long time ago in the 1920s. Uh, another Olympic athlete, Eric Little, did the same thing. And he once said this. He once said, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Now it is Sydney's turn. And boy, did God make her fast. If you notice in that photo, not only did she win gold in the 400 meter hurdles, it was an Olympic world record, a new one. 51.46, that's all the way around the track, jumping over things in less than a minute. Takes me like five. <laughs> and I don't jump, like that's it. <laughs> God has done these things through her and she gives him the glory. Who do people say that I am, Jesus asked. Sydney, on the stage of the world, has openly declared, Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the King. Amen? Amen? You know, as during this series, as we continue talking about identity, we understand that we can only know ourselves when we know Jesus. McLaughlin was floundering in her running career until she gave herself to the Lord. Once she began to know her identity in Jesus Christ, only then did things come together for her on the track. But you don't have to be an Olympic runner to make this discovery. This week, I challenge you, take some time, reflect on Peter from our passage today, and ask yourself a couple of probing questions. Ask yourself, what in you reflects the character of Christ? And what in you still needs to be redeemed? We are sons and daughters of the King. Our job in this life is to live, to work, and to grow more like Jesus each and every day. And to give God all of the glory. Anything else that we are doing, we are merely seeing it from a human point of view. Instead, live your lives with heaven in view. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, for Peter, for his inspiration, for his moment of heavenly knowledge to be able to stand and declare that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But also, Lord, thank you for letting us know that he's human, <laughs> that he's still a work in progress and so are we. Lord, it's so easy to default and to, and, 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 to, and to fall back into viewing everything through a human point of view. To try to fulfill man's expectations. When really, Lord, all we need to concern ourselves is with yours. To live our lives for you. Paul says in 2 Timothy, I have finished the race. I have fought the good fight. And Lord, maybe because it's the Olympics, sports analogies are just everywhere right now. But you've, all, you've put us all in a race, put us all on a path. And help us to run, to walk, and to live not to build ourselves up, Lord, but for your glory, for your honor, for your name. Let your will be done in our lives this day and every day. Amen.